Look out, there's somebody massing Cyclops in this episode of Prototype Telling Tall Tales. And we'll get into why I chose that title a little bit later on. But it's time to talk about how the Fraud of July went, this tournament that was held on the 13th. It was a, a great success in pretty much every way, I would say. I, I was very happy with the not just the results, but how the tournament actually ran, the fact that I had help with it. Uh, definitely the first time I've really leaned on other people to essentially like run their own uh, sections of the tournament, which is very, very helpful and uh, otherwise would not have been able to run the tournament in the way that it ran. So a big shout out to the admin staff, the people who supported me in that area. I will get into the names and such uh, when I get into that topic, which is coming up right after the show intro here. But uh, obviously after that, there's been some updates to the ranking system I want to cover, including a list of players in the upper class now. And uh, some very exciting things that we can talk about uh, going into our next tournament called Tyrant's Tale. Maybe you're starting to figure out why this episode is called that. But uh, yes, very exciting in that sense because it, it, it means something not just for the competitive player that's really into tournaments, but also for the casual player who really likes campaigns and, and stories. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about that when we get to that point. Afterwards, of course, we've got a community roundup where I will be talking about some of the homies that have joined us recently, as well as some of the maps that have been made recently. And then we get into coffee questions where you, yes, you, can go to the link at the bottom left-hand corner. You can donate towards the project. You can join the ranks of the coffee chads, the donators, and uh, yeah, gain access to Ahmed's Arson Isle, which is great alliteration. That's triple A, actually. So uh, obviously you want to donate towards that. You want to you fund that. If you enjoy Cosmonarchy, enjoy the tournaments. I encourage you to go ahead and do that. You can go to the tiers page uh, and the memberships page or whatever it's called on Coffee, And you can actually look at the little things that we have there as far as uh, perks for you. So definitely something I recommend. And of course, one of those perks is the coffee questions. Like you can ask these questions every time I record one of these episodes, which is usually once a week. So it uh, definitely gets you uh, a lot of money. I mean, you, you think about it, like if you're donating $3 a week, which is the, the lowest tier you can get to for one of these memberships, or sorry, $3 a month, then what you're basically saying is, uh, I'm gonna ask one question per dollar and then get a bonus question on top if I'm recording four episodes that month. I mean, think about that. Dude, that's value. Plus all the other stuff you get access to. So anyway, figured I would shell that for a little bit. But now I think it's time to talk about the fraud of July. It was a grand event in celebration of Iskatumesk's 37th birthday because yes, he is the Diablo 3 number now, but also uh, pretty exciting stuff. That was also, I mean, <laughs> July 13th, 2024 will probably live on in history for a while. Uh, and unfortunately for uh, the whole world, it wasn't exactly because of uh, an epic tournament in Cosmonarchy, but uh, you know, wherever you were at that time, I know where I was when that uh, when that near death experience occurred. And I guess uh, technically it was an actual death experience for someone, which is very sad. Uh, of course, speaking about the uh, the Trump shooting, but I, I will say uh, that I, I will remember that. Uh, I don't think that it's uh, fair to call that our 9-11, our generation's 9-11, but uh, I was too young to remember that. I'm definitely not too young to remember what just happened this past weekend, but uh, hey, anyway, uh, definitely something that I think, you gotta, you gotta point that out and just sort of acknowledge it so that you can move past that elephant in the room, because uh, goddamn, was that fucking wild. And so, moving swiftly on uh, past that event, uh, just, uh, you know, thoughts and prayers type of, type of vibe is all I can really say. Uh, and I can talk about the actual event uh, that we were talking about here, the, the Fraud of July, the, the actual event where we were focusing our attention on. And yeah, again, I have to shout out the people that contributed very positively towards this event. Neblime donated the prize pool that we ended up using here. It was a hundred bucks. So happy about that. I was able to hand $12 or 13, something like $12 per uh, person per, who won their group. Uh, the rest of it was uh, covering some of the expenses of the day. Uh, not, not very many of them, if you consider how many people were involved and how many hours it took, but a little bit, a little bit of a cut. And, uh, you know, just making sure that we can make this sustainable to some degree and keep it going. And so uh, I do appreciate that. Uh, currently finding a way, trying to find a way to, to send money to everybody. I think most people are accounted for, but there is one person I got to find an avant-garde method of, of not just using PayPal. Uh, so that, of course, uh, adds a little bit of a, a confusion to the ranks. But we're getting there. We're getting there on the payouts. Uh, most everybody has received it already. Uh, and so shout out to you guys for participating in the tournament. We had 18 people play on that day uh, in tournament matches. 
And after, uh, you know, even following that, like we had two other people that couldn't get sorted into a group uh, and they stood by as, uh, as a, you know, ringer type reserve player, but uh, everybody else showed up. So pretty cool stuff. <clears throat> pretty happy about the, the way that things have gone. Uh, I will say shout out to Shopkeeper Dog, who was not able to make it there, but I definitely think he would have done some damage had he been able to participate in these tournament games. He, uh, he did sign up for the next one, which is always exciting, but uh, we'll get to that in due time. And shout out to the names specifically of the people who assisted on the Fraud of July. Uh, these names are uh, Veek7, who streamed the undercard for Group A, we also had Jujik, who joined Veek7 for casting that undercard and helped the admin process, but also joined me for casting the Group B upper card, which Veek actually played in. Uh, and then we had a Noslix running the Group B undercard. He recorded it, he did interviews, he uh, handled the admining process, obviously spectated the games and stuff, so uh, casted them. Uh, and, uh, you know, we even had an FFA. The inaugural FFA happened in that group. I could not believe it. Uh, it was even in an unexpected manner. So when that video comes out, I will be eagerly watching the uh, everything up until that uh, FFA. Uh, and then the uh, end stage uh, for the final game after that, because I was not able to, to join for that. But uh, definitely pretty cool. I joined the group A, a undercard a little bit after uh, Arbuz just blitzed through his group. And then uh, we had Mystery Meet and, and the Night Fox do, do a best of three to, to settle the second placer. Uh, so definitely an interesting set, but uh, it, we'll have to see. We'll have to wait and see. So, uh, you know, where wh wh those players end up do going as far as growth is concerned? Uh, because we've got the Night Fox here switching his uh, switching his tail, uh, changing his tune from uh, Zerg to Protoss. And uh, I'm not 100% sure, um, you know, if he's going to be signing up for this forthcoming tournament or not. He hasn't uh, hasn't uh, man d committed to it just yet, but he, he takes some time to figure his schedule out. And uh, it would be interesting to see his Protoss in action after... Uh, he was saying that he felt like his, uh, you know, Zerg was too weak uh, and maybe his style wasn't working out. So interesting stuff there. Uh, I will say that uh, we definitely had uh, a couple of interesting moments as well. Uh, and some of those were brought to you by other casters that joined me for the main stage cast. I already shouted out Jujik for Group B, uh, the upper card there. But uh, Shadow Fury joined me for Group A's upper card. And then we had, we only had two groups, uh, you know, rather, we only had an, one group per C and D for those time slots. There was no undercard there. Uh, there was, we were one sign up away, guys, from, from getting to 21 contestants, which would have been uh, interesting to say the least. Uh, but uh, that, that would have been a group C undercard if people could have made it. Uh, anyway, though, uh, the end result is that uh, Jack Yelansky, Jujik, and Green Eggs and Spam played in Group C, uh, with uh, Biddy B, Lucy, and uh, Son of Alcatraz playing in Group D. And uh, those were uh, the casted by uh, Group C was Neb Lime and myself, and then Mesk joined me for Group D. Uh, so we had a different co-caster every single group, which is a first. Uh, Jujik obviously double dipping as Group A undercard, and then obviously Anoslix uh, handling the, uh, the being the, the chief principal caster there for uh, Group B's undercard. So really big shout out to everybody it was a, it was a team effort when you look at the list of people that was involved in the staff we have it had like a staff chat thread that i made for it and we had to have that because like normally i would just be like dming neblime like hey are you good to cast at this day because that's when the tournament is and like what time slots can you make and then you know maybe i would dm mask or, or uh, veek or whoever else might be interested in casting those were really the only two but since then we've had a lot of people joining me for cast there was like a period of time where i think it was like over a week of the only games that were uploaded to the channel uh for castovers were the uh, like we're all co-casted i don't think there was a solo cast in there uh, so that was really wild uh, and i guess i should probably take this quick sort of sidebar tangent time to tell you guys that the castover daily streak is of course over it concluded actually on the day of the tournament i did not count the day of the tournament as a uh, uh, as part of the streak and so uh, that that concludes us with 133 days of daily Cosmonarchy video uploads, uh, which is oh daily Cosmonarchy castovers I should say, uh, which is pretty crazy, pretty crazy. So uh, some of those days we did even double up. Um, if we go back to like the uh, some of the, the the Gauntlet casts, I believe were uh, double released and stuff. Uh, so that's that's pretty wild to think that there was a point in time where that was happening, but. Um, yeah, uh, unfortunately, due to some uh, time constraints imposed by having to work uh, at the real-time job, or the real-time <laughs> real strategy, uh, no, the, the real-life job, uh, th that is uh, going away. The, the time is, is a bit more constrained, and I'm going to have to take some time to sort of adapt my uh, work schedule and, and like figuring out, like, okay, when can I eke out some time to record videos and stuff? Because realistically speaking, it shouldn't take too long to do that stuff, even if I have to go down to, like, 
You know, one thing that I, I think is actually not so great about, for example, Artosis Cast's YouTube channel is that a lot of his videos end up being like 11 minutes long, 18 minutes long. I don't know what the average length is. Maybe it's about 15. I feel like that's pretty small, pretty short. I'm sure some, I mean, he's obviously way bigger than I am on the on YouTube, but uh, and in general, in terms of like web presence. However, I will just say that looking at that, I feel like the videos could stand to be longer. When I watch them, I'm usually watching them with breakfast or something, and I don't want to rush through my food, you know? I like to take my time, uh, and so uh, for, for the videos to, to be so short definitely seems like a bit of a, a silly move. So anyway, uh, that's something that I personally uh, do believe in, and I do I do know that the vast majority of the vocal audience here has said that they prefer the longer videos. Uh, obviously, some people would prefer uh, probably shorter ones, uh, but th they seem to be a, a significant minority, especially in terms of the people who are actively talking about it, which is, of course, the people who you get signals from. Like, videos have sometimes had, like, thousands of views, uh, but, you know, the comments are, like, there's 20 comments, and you can get the same number of comments on a video with, like, well... 50 views or 100 views. And uh, so it, it just goes to tell you that it really depends on how engaged the audience is. And the engaged people are going to be the ones who actually um, drive change in, in one way or another uh, and, and really get their voice heard out there. So, uh, you know, maybe I'm wrong about this idea that most people want the longer videos or, or you know, 30 minutes at least or whatever. Uh, but that is uh, that's the signal that I have been sent pretty loud and clear, uh, not unanimously, but not, uh, you know, definitely in terms of a majority vote. Yeah, it's been that. So that's worth pointing out. Uh, I do appreciate uh, people who have shared their feedback, uh, and I'm looking forward to the next streak. We'll see how long it can be. 133 is a, a pretty long uh, amount. Uh, it's certainly a good amount of time. I uh, started in sometime in February and uh, went all the way to July, uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, I think technically I could probably... I might be able to make a similar-ish streak before the end of the year, so I guess we'll have to wait and see, you know? Let's see what happens. But uh, not going to promise anything in particular, just going to say that uh, we're, we're going to be we're gonna be back at some point uh, with, uh, with frequent uploads, and I, I don't see why it, you know, daily can't be the, the way that we go uh, again. So, uh, you yeah, know, we'll figure that out. But yes, going back to the Throttle July... I do feel like the tournament, uh, the matches themselves were very entertaining. Uh, I know that uh, Arbus Budesh was tuning into the undercard and uh, said that they were enjoyable to watch, even though they weren't the highest level. It was interesting to see people play. And I feel like when people who are even at the, you know, there's going to be some people who are very focused on high level play, right? And those are people like Hit'em Up, uh, to some extent Neblime. These are the kinds of people who they want to see like the best of the best, and it's sometimes painful to watch. Uh, people who play poorly or, 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 you know, inefficiently or something like that. I know Veek is actually like this a little bit himself. So that makes it even funnier in some ways that he was casting the undercard, but I do appreciate him doing that. Um, and, and anyway, uh, the, the point is like, like Mesk is somebody who loves to see like silly games and those are, you know, just in, in general, they tend to be on the lower end of the skill spectrum if they're going to be on the silly side, because the higher tier players are often going to be able to play more aggressively. Uh, and I was actually having a chat about this when it came to the ranking stuff with Veek, uh, talking about how, like, the the top players that we have right now, with maybe the exception of players like Hit'em Up, actually, uh, and maybe, uh, you know, if Top Ramen can can really tighten up his uh, crisis response and crisis management, then I guess he could probably be in this uh, running, too. But I feel like if we had a... a if we, if we ha and suddenly had an injection of, like, say, a thousand new players, which is a very large number, obviously... Um, just in terms of signal bias, I actually don't know how many of our players that are, for example, currently class one would remain at the uppermost level. Like if they're, say, the top six of the current player uh, player base, if we, you know, factor this forward and we have a thousand new players eventually roll in, uh, which to me just seems like a matter of time, we would theoretically at that point basically be at the point where we're talking about like, oh, hmm, uh, well, I guess, uh, you know, the Shambler is like, you know, uh, top 100, maybe, instead of top six, right? Like, as an idea. So, uh, you know, th that's the the real placement of them. You know, they, they might, they're definitely not at, like, the apex of what you can do in the game. Uh, and so that's uh, very exciting to see, very cool to see. Uh, but uh, also really cool to see the different play styles. Like, none of the top players have the same play style at all, which is pretty interesting. And I don't know if that would remain the case uh, once we, say, in injected Koreans into the game or something. Uh, but uh, definitely something that's really cool to think about. Uh, so I figured I would just throw that out there. But uh, yeah, uh, as a result of the Fraud of July, we did have a couple of people graduate over a pair of, of competitors. Arbuz Budesh and Top Ramen graduated to Class 1 based on their performance in the tournament. A kind of a small sample size, but they were already on the border anyway. 
and um, yeah, I, I got to be. It has to be said, I'm a little bit surprised about Crankendow and Week Seven and their, their performances. I, I did feel like. Uh, I was surprised in a, in a, I guess, a positive way that Veek was able to defeat Crankendow. Like, for Veek, that's a pretty good scalp to take. Uh, Crankendow did underperform, uh, so I do hope that he's able to shake that off in time for whenever he participates in another event. Uh, and uh, hopefully it is in the qualifier to uh, Tyrant's Tale. But... The other uh, cool thing about uh, the sort of Group A area uh, was that Mystery Meat was indeed on the field again. And that was a really cool, you know, homecoming, so to speak. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it was a little bit anticlimactic versus Arbus. He did not have the, the sort of up-to-date read on the meta to hold 3-gate and hold 2-gate expand. And, and the Zealot Ecclesiast ball just uh, sort of ran through him on both uh, Genesis Y and Oblivion. So that was a little bit unfortunate for our boy, our king, Mystery Meat, the most accomplished and winningest player in Cosmonarchy history. And uh, he was able to take down Night Fox, but it wasn't a an easy set. It was definitely a uh, hard-fought situation uh, where there were some very uh, bizarre early game activity from actually both players uh, in some ways. So... Yep, it's uh, that one was a tight group uh, for the second place, and even though it was a 2-0 for meat, it definitely was not. Um, it, that doesn't say everything. It, it wasn't easy, you know. Like I, especially on the, the game on Fata Morgana, I don't. That's a game where I described it as I don't think either player is like feeling confident about their performance. Obviously, the Night Fox it was uh, was on the losing end of that, so he wasn't feeling confident. But Mystery Meat was not feeling confident either. Like. I, I don't think so anyway. Like, I feel like he, pr he probably felt like he barely overwhelmed his opponent, you know? Um, so anyway, uh, that is that. Now, uh, going over to the other groups, uh, the undercards I haven't actually seen too much of, but I do know the results, and it was some Terran victories, and so congrats to the Terrans in those groups. Uh, but when it came to the uh, Group C and Group D, of course, I did watch those games very closely. Group D was just Biddy B uh, eight pooling to victory. Um, poor son of Alcatraz had no idea what was happening. Uh, but then the the TVPs that Alcatraz played versus Lucy, Lucy kind of was just free to do his thing, and then eventually attacked with a big blob of stuff, and then uh, and Alcatraz kind of held, and then kind of didn't, and he, he was kind of holding until he kind of wasn't. Uh, but he did end up playing some games after that tournament uh, and felt like he could have, uh, you know, he can see areas to improve, uh, which is always good. And I feel like if he goes back and watches the casts for the tournament games, if he hasn't already, uh, I mean, he was asking about them immediately. So I, I, I think uh, it would be interesting to, to see his sort of take on that. Um, but yeah, like it's, uh, you know, hopefully he's able to, to look at that and say, okay, well, here's how I can do better. And then, you know, he can move up because uh, everybody in the class update, I'll talk about this a little bit more, but everybody got bumped down uh, to insert a new class between Sovereign and Aspirant, which were previously one and two. Now they're one and three. So there's a new class two categorization. And that means our previous class twos are now class three and our previous class threes are now class four. So him being a class four player, I feel like class four is the easiest rank to practice up and eventually graduate from. Uh, so like, and I feel like that's always the case for the bottom rank, like the, the, the case for the bottom rank into the next the highest rank or whatever, next lowest rank, I guess, is, um, it's always the easiest to do because, uh, everybody's making a lot of mistakes. And so all you have to do is like find a couple that are within your, uh, wheelhouse and within your skill set to actually improve, uh, and then practice those and then do better. Uh, and then you're, you're kind of guaranteed to win more games that way. So, uh, and of course that the, the skills in question are a little bit different depending on the matchup, but also depending on your race. Um, for example, this is uh, probably a truism, but if you're a lower, an underclass player, as we call it, so below the, you're, you're not class one or not, you're not class two uh, in the new ranking system, then I would highly recommend that you don't play random, um, you know, just because uh, as a result of going through and doing that, I mean, you're, you're kind of in a, a rough spot when it comes to trying to build up the the, the understanding of what the your race does and the understanding of how you want to proceed. So I do feel like that's a, a good move to make, but uh, there's, you know, something that something to think about. Stay, stay clear random uh, in terms of actually trying to play serious games. You could play random versus AI or, you know, just for fun or whatever, that's fine. But if you're specifically trying to look for improvement, um, you know, like usually when you're really confident in your own play, say you're playing Terran, you're really confident in how to play Terran, that usually ends up being a sign that, okay, now I can think about, okay, we, I struggle in TVP, so I'm going to play some Protoss and try to get good enough at Protoss and do the things that my opponents are doing. 
um, you know, based on studying the replays and stuff, good enough at Protoss to kind of understand like what the wind conditions are and also where I'm vulnerable because go playing through that Protoss perspective can give you that edge. And then you can kind of come back to Terran and be like, okay, now I know what to do, uh, or at least I have some ideas to test. So that can be a way to go. And that's something that I do encourage, but only when you're in that stage where you're already confident in your play. And if you're not like an upper class player in your, in any one race, uh, that, that is a concern. That is, uh, you know, something that where that's probably a signal that you don't need to get start off racing or, or anything, unless you're just trying to have some fun, which I always encourage. Definitely have fun. The game is is there for that in some ways, but uh, it's also there for you to be better. So check that out. And I do feel like the um, the fraud of July was good for getting better. It was, it was good for players to practice up for. Uh, Crankendow did leave a comment on the stream vod saying something to the effect of it would be great to have one of these kinds of tournaments once a month. Well, get ready because we've got another one. Uh, but it, he, his essence of the point was that it does give the player base a lot to strive towards, and I do like that a lot. So uh, I, I think in, in the future, having it be once a month uh, is probably a good good shout, uh, even if it's a small event like the Fraud of July was comparatively to something like Acropolis or even something like Tyrant's Tale. Having a single day invitational or weekend tournament uh, can be pretty good for that. So let's see what we can make happen, boys. But uh, for now, it will be time very soon to talk about the updates to the ranking system. So uh, when we're talking about Cosmonarchy's ranking system, we're talking about these classes. And I like to give epic names to everything. It's something that actually Veek himself was the one to suggest uh, was uh, we should give epic names to the, the classes and instead of just being class one and class two, which is what they were before. So uh, class one is sovereign and class two now, instead of being aspirant, and, and I say before, this is like maybe many months ago now is when they were renamed. But now, just now, fresh today off the presses, I'm recording this on Tuesday, the 16th of July. Uh, just today, I was able to update the ranking page, which I will link in the description of this video. You can see the upper class players. Um, I would say if, the, if I had to include, an, uh, there's 11 players on this list. If I had to include number 12, it would probably be Jackie Langsky. Uh, but uh, I just need to see a little bit more from him. Uh, if he had won his group flawlessly and looked pretty confident doing it, I probably would have included him on this list. But just a little, just like narrowly, he's like on the teetering on the edge. So if he can just handily dismiss every, uh, you know, class three player, then he can pretty much, or start, you know, taking games off of the other class twos, then, then he kind of shows himself that he's, uh, okay, he's definitely, you know, proven that. So that would be really cool to include him on that list. But anyway, uh, the list from first to 11th is uh, class one sovereign, <clears throat> hit him up, Neblime, Hamster, The Shambler, Arbuz Budesh, and Top Ramen. And then class two Herald, uh, Veek7, Crankendow, Ecalypso, who actually has an inactivity warning. He hasn't been playing lately, so he would probably end up getting dropped in like the next step. If I update this once a month or a couple times a month or whatever, uh, the next update will probably see him gone unless he re re returns to us, the prodigal son. Uh, and then, of course, number 10 is the Night Fox and 11 is Shopkeeper Dog. So check that out. Uh, do have a lot of... Uh, a lot of thoughts about this, uh, including a second class, which is Herald now instead of Aspirant, which is now class three. And of course, class three was previously Hotshot. Now that's class four. Uh, the names are going to stay the same. Everybody's kind of in those ranks is, is going to stay the same. But it was becoming pretty clear that uh, the difference between a top tier player in the Sovereign class and some of the players in Aspirant class uh, were kind of small. But that, like basically the Aspirant class had too many different skill levels in it. Uh, to the point where it it was necessary to further delineate between the tip the top of the top right, the uh, the tip of the top the creme de la creme of the aspirant class, and uh, you know grab those players. In this case, there's only five of them that I wanted to grab, uh, but maybe six if you count Jack. Like I was saying, uh, is a debatable case. And then pull them up and put them into their own class, right? The herald class. So that's what I've done. And that kind of, um, I think that does normalize the skill disparity. I, there's 16 players, I believe, still in class uh, three now, which, uh, the aspiring class. There's still a lot of players in that in that grouping, and despite extracting a bunch of them. And so looking at it from that perspective, kind of tells me the whole story, right? It's, um, you know, and, and by the way, just to show you how far things have gone, like obviously Mystery Meat has been out for a while. I did not put Mystery Meat in, in the Herald class. You may have noticed when I was reading out those names. So uh, even though he was able to uh, take out the Night Fox who had a poor tournament showing, uh, that was his only ranked showing hitherto. And the only games that he's played since then 
uh, I've had it reported that uh, they were against Neblime and uh, Hit'em Up, who are obviously sovereign class players, and apparently they were not very competitive. So, uh, and I don't really use hearsay to, to influence the rankings, but like if I had, I might have been given pause if I had at least heard that, yeah, he played, you know, uh, Neblime and he, he was like able to defeat him two to one, or, or you know, he, he took like five games off of him out of uh, 10 games that were played or something like that. Like that would be something where I'd be like, oh, okay, well, maybe he's got a little bit more. Uh, maybe I would have had a more charitable viewing then of his uh, tournament play, but you looking at just what we have, uh, it not not herald material yet. Uh, obviously, I have no doubt that he can learn the meta and and practice it. It's just a question of does he want to put in the time? Does he have the time to put in in the first place? Uh, definitely something that will be interesting to hear about uh, in the future. But uh, as we get a little bit uh, deeper into this, I, uh, it is worth noting that we do have these different classes. Uh, the, well, the change, the, the new class that we've added, and the, the differences in the categorization. Uh, obviously, trying to make Sovereign a bit more of an exclusive club, uh, and that's why you have to really like we had this whole uh, graduation ceremony, so to speak, uh, for Arbus and Top Ramen in the Fraud of July tournament. Uh, but if you're saying, "Oh man, I, I liked being class two, even though like my aspi my actual aspiring class did not change, but now I, now it's class three. If, if you're feeling like a little bit attacked in terms of your status, uh, all I can say is there is a tournament coming up that has a qualifier in it. And obviously tournament placings, including in qualifiers, do factor in towards your class calculation. And so if you have a deep run in the qualifier, if you make it to the tournament, especially, I mean, there's only going to be two spots, I think, maybe three if Arbus doesn't accept the invite. But as of right now, everybody except for Arbus in class one has accepted the invite to the tournament proper. And it's an eight, team, uh, eight player tournament. So that's uh, five out of six players uh, from class one have already accepted, which means we only have three slots. And again, if Arbus accepts, it's going to be two slots up for grabs from the qualifier. So it's going to be a very cutthroat affair uh we can uh we can accept up to 16 players in the qualifier but uh, it looks like I, I don't think we're actually going to get that many uh, that was just like me planning for extreme uh, you know extreme situations right uh and so thinking about it like that if you're in this herald class and you think well i could be a class one and if you're in the you know uh, if you're in the aspiring class and you think, well, I should be up there in the Herald class, uh, you know, if, you, if you're Jack or even if you're like Biddy B or Three Crow or, um, you know, I'm thinking about like Biddy B and Jack obviously won their groups recently. Uh, and so uh, th they would be like the next in line in theory to jump up to the, the Herald class. If you guys can make it happen, if you guys uh, think that you have what it takes, the gusto, the gonads, then I would highly, strongly recommend jumping into the, that qualifier, signing up for it, uh, and uh, and really proving it, you know, proving it on the on the battleground. So, uh, of course, I will announce the map pool and stuff for that qualifier soon, uh, but uh, definitely something to uh, sort of get, a, get a, a jump on because it's happening this weekend. It's starting this weekend, and we'll try to bang out all the games uh, throughout the week if need be, uh, if there are any matches that need to be played still after that. So uh, the weekend is where it's all at, so try to get your availability squared away for that and uh, sign up and, and et cetera. And I will catch you guys uh, for that tournament. Uh, we'll be, we won't be bringing that action to you guys live when it comes to the qualifier, uh, but uh, we will definitely be uh, casting them uh, you know, from replays and stuff. So uh, that'll be fun. That'll be exciting. And so all I can say is uh, stay tuned. You know, uh, Watch this space, as it's, as it's sometimes said. So I do want to talk about Tyrant's Tale's main event and the kind of point of the event. Uh, it's not just about the ranking. It's not just about how, yeah, you can participate in the qualifier and, you know, get ranking points. Uh, there will be single player content created for this event uh, in, 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 you know, re related to this event. And so uh, it will basically be dramatized in a single player campaign style or mission set style uh, release. So I'm very excited about this because it's kind of a, an A-B testing thing of like, you know, what you can do. Uh, th there's a couple of reasons why I decided to try to organize another tournament so soon. One of those reasons is because we had such great support from the staff, uh, the, the, the community, uh, and Oslix and, and Jujik and Veek and Shadow Fury and Mesk and Neblime all joined me. That's six names of people who joined me to participate in the tournament, uh, not just as players in, in the case of two of them, uh, but also in, in the case of, of casters and admins, uh, referees, etc. So these are the kinds of things where when I, you know, when I'm, I was dreading a little bit fra the fraud of July. I was, uh, I had a little bit of, of trepidation, the sense of like foreboding, like, man, this could, this could be really like an overwhelming amount of work. And I, I didn't really get a chance to, 
ahead of time uh, before the tournament, I really sit down and think about it and just like be still and think, meditate on it. Like, okay, is it actually going to be that bad? Because then I probably would have come to the conclusion that everything would be fine. And everything indeed was fine. And part of it, the reason why it was fine is because I had all of the help that I had. And that makes me very encouraged for the future. Because even if somebody who wants to play in the tournament is unable to, or they don't qualify or whatever, they might still be interested in helping at the tournament, you know, adminning the games, uh, or, you know, casting them, uh, recording them locally and casting them, uploading them to their own channel, which is also a great service unto itself. Uh, obviously, uh, just joining me for the cast definitely takes the, the load off of my voice, as you might imagine, uh, for having to, I've done a lot of solo casting, uh, especially in the last couple of months. And so having a co-commentator for that, a co-fraudmentator for that is very great. It's very helpful. And so that has been a great boon as well as uh, everything else that was going on. So I do very much appreciate that. And I feel like there is a, there's a, uh, a strong communal feel uh, because of that, I, I've given up some of the responsibility of running every single part of the tournament to some of the other people like Veek7 doing the streaming and then uh, Anoslix doing one of the groups as well. Uh, and, and so that's that's very cool. It's very awesome that I, I know that we can do stuff like that so we can get a little bit more ambitious with some of the scheduling and with the number of players. And obviously the game stability is improving. I, we had one issue the entire tournament out of uh, 18 people playing a minimum of six games each. So we're talking about... Uh, so it's not 18 times six, but it's um, 18 uh, divided by three, uh, which is six uh, times six minimum. Uh, so you, yeah, that, that's a decent number of games. Some of them did go longer. I think uh, at least in one group, we had uh, eight games. Uh, that would have been the group uh, B undercard. And uh, there were definitely two groups, uh, I think, that had... Let's see, there's group C that had seven games. And then there were, I believe... Uh, group A undercard also had seven games. So uh, just some quick math while I add that together. And uh, I want to say uh, that we had, let's see. Yeah, is that 40 games? Yeah, so 40 matches were played and only one of them busted. That's... Um, that's pretty good. And, uh, you know, that, that's a good ratio. Uh, obviously ideally it would be way less than that. Uh, but, uh, one out of 40 is, uh, is not half bad. Uh, we'll take that. That's including an FFA decider. I bet everybody thought that was going to break. I certainly con was concerned about it. Uh, and so the, with the game improving in stability and the player base improving in, in number, uh, it made sense to try to do something more ambitious with the way that the fraud of July went. Now we're got talking about ambition in terms of, Having bracket style tournaments, including the like the qualifier and the main event, are both bracket style as opposed to the group style, which means that it's sort of like throne room playoffs, uh, like the Acropolis number one throne room stage or the Acropolis number one gauntlet stages. Actually, uh, it's double elimination, so you've got two tournament lives. Uh, the initial series for the qualifier are best of three into a best of five uh, qualification bout, and then the uh, secondary. Uh, well, the main stage, I suppose, is best of five matches with a best of seven grand final. Uh, so exactly, in fact, like the throne room stage. Uh, so that's the kind of format that we're using. And uh, the reason why I was talking about like single player campaign stuff, uh, I was inspired in part by the way that uh, Green Eggs was talking about how like the thematics of, uh, you know, trying to mow through all of Jackie Langsky's infinite Zerg uh, definitely felt like, oh, God damn, dude, this is just a nonstop onslaught and I'm, I'm just barely holding on until I'm not and then I get overwhelmed. And that's... Um, that's one of those things where I feel like, yeah, of course, like the thema like the, the game feels more cinematic without feeling like we are um, cheapening the gameplay experience. It's like the, the story that is told through the gameplay is exactly the kind of thing that we're looking for. And so uh, that sort of thing is just fodder for those kinds of ideas. Uh, it's, it's great. Uh, what would you say? Great, great, uh, great for growing that kind of crop. You know what I mean? It's, it's excellent soil for that. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very, very pleased with the idea and, and the pitch here for this tournament being, okay, you know, if you're the, if you end up being the tournament victor, if you end up being somebody who qualifies through the gauntlet, uh, through the, through the qualification bout, then, you know, there's going to be a story told about you. If you have a really, really epic series versus somebody, there's going to be a, 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 you know, a mission that chronicles that, like something more for you guys to play for, something more for you guys to root for if you're just at home watching, just interested in how the, the tournament is going to unfold. And maybe I'll try to tie everything together in a neat little narrative. I think it would be possible to do that even if I was building the, the missions on the fly. Uh, but fictionalizing and dramatizing the 
uh, the, the players and, who as uh, you know our cosmon arcs our competitors as you know commanders of their various uh, factions uh, you know if they're an organ as Zerg or they're a uh, you know a, a justicar as Protoss or they are uh, indeed a, just a captain a commander as as Terran uh, these are the kinds of things where the you know th this is uh, this is really interesting stuff to try to to go with and I, I remember way back when I was playing Starcraft one I was playing the, on the ladder uh, you know before it was a ladder like on iCup and stuff. Um, even when I was losing games, oftentimes they were, you know, when they weren't being, you know, lost because of silly reasons, essentially, uh, oftentimes it would feel very thematic that like, you know, the Zerg overwhelmed my Protoss base or something. And I could imagine like, I would get ideas just then and there about, you know, how I could tell a cool story with that. And so, of course, it kind of makes sense. It's, it's something that I've talked about a lot. It's something I've thought about a lot. We're finally doing it. I know that a lot of other um, people have dis have talked about this before about the idea of like uh, I think it's in one of, it's in one of either Stormgate Zero Space or Immortal I can't remember uh, but one of them is basically like the the win rates of the player base decide like how the stories go or something like that uh, which is an uh, you know it's another way of of trying to bridge the gap between uh, casual single player type players and competitive players because if they want their uh, and I know Helldivers too has done this obviously as well uh, but if they want their um, say they want their particular faction to win, then they would, uh, you know, okay, I'm going to play as the Zerg because I really want the Zerg to win in the story. Uh, and that's like my home, my home race. I, I want these guys to win. And so I'm going to try to be as good as I can so that I can push the win rate up or whatever. And, um, you know, you could imagine um, something like if you have the Zerg on, say, the uh, like on a specific map, even like we could eventually see an update, a, a reskin of, of a map. And this might be something that we try to explore a little bit more in a new engine or something. But think about this. Think about like you're playing on Oblivion, that map by Beaver, the, the desert map. And, you know, Zerg just has a is able to totally envelop and, and win the the that map like nine times out of ten or something crazy. And then after the, the tournament where that happens, the, uh, the, the, the infrastructure is all infested. The, the, the terrain is meaningfully changed. Uh, maybe there's gameplay updates as well. Uh, and we kind of like couch those specifically in the way that Zerg infested the place or whatever. Uh, but definitely like a reskin of the map would be in order. And I think that kind of shit is really cool to think about. So, you know, like lasting impact on the competitive space, as well as, of course, creating the single player content uh, where maybe we even base it off of the maps that you played in. Like maybe I take, say, like a, a, the decider is on, you know, um, there's like this new map by Veek7 that I haven't actually seen, but may maybe that's in the in the pool. It's called Cold Sweat. And maybe maybe I take Cold Sweat and, and I turn it into a single player mission like I, I expand the map and i change some stuff around and i like obviously make it asymmetrical or whatever uh you know that, that those would be things that you would probably end up expecting uh and um you know i change some stuff around but it's still based on that map and so you could think of it as a dramatization as a retelling as a fictionalization of the events that happened in the in the mash in, in the uh, actual map and so you know another way to think about this is you might be thinking about like well pronago what about um you know are, are all the campaign missions going to be 1v1s and some of them will probably end up being 1v1s but like think about it like this uh if you have the, we've got the clans we've got uscm and we've got s these clans for cosmonarchy and now imagine that uh, some USCM players sign up for the the qualifier, and um, they 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 try their damnedest to to qualify through, and maybe one of them gets through, and so like then we could tell a story about how the USCM were all at the, like their those players those cosmonauts ended up being allies, and then you know they would fight against whoever else you know if they were ass players or they were something else, then they would be taking up taking those guys on maybe unaffiliated guys whatever, and um, the point would be that like you could still have the team games based on that. Again, it's a fictionalization. It's a, a narrativeization, dramatization of what's going on. And so I, I think that has a lot of potential. There's plenty of things that you can do uh, with creative license. You can take um, one game uh, and, and, and try to turn that into a mission. You can take you know, a whole, like a player's whole run through the, the, the tournament and turn it into one or two missions. Uh, that, that would be one thing that you could do. Imagining if, say, you know, Green Eggs and Spam signs up into the qualifier and he... It, you know, he, he wins one match and loses two. And so his, he's out of the tournament. Like we could actually have a story that tells about, you know, this bio oriented commander who, you know, like he's the, he, sure. He might be the protagonist of, of one mission, the, the one where he wins. Uh, and then, you know, maybe uh, there's a, a mission later on where you, you defeat him as like a Zerg player. And then you defeat him again as a Protoss player based on like who he fights or whatever. Right. <clears throat> or you could imagine somebody who specifically, there are two series that I really want to, to, 
to look at and say, wow, these, these two matches were really cool, but by themselves, one of them by themselves is not really enough for fodder for one mission. Well, I could take that and make it a 1v2, so you're fighting against both of the, the opponents that that player fought against. And so if it's like Neblime taking on Hamster and then he takes on uh, Hit Him Up after and he wins both of those matches and it's like, oh my God, well, you imagine he starts off fighting against whoever Hamster's fictionalized version is and then, you know, Neblime's fictionalized version is du duking it out and then uh, Hit Him Up's fictional version er, appears, right? And that, that would be like a, an arrival in the middle of the map to swing it as like a, a 1v2. And it's like, oh shit, you know, backup is here, the even tougher challenge. And, and so I could combine those two series that were played into one match. Uh, one, one single-player mission. Uh, so just as another example. And maybe some of this will even be co-op. Like, I actually don't know what the format of the single-player content will be, if it'll even be strictly single-player, but the campaign or map scenario content, you know, map, map set content. <clears throat> I'm not sure about that. But these are cool ideas, and I feel like they deserve to be explored, and that is what I will be doing following the conclusion of this event. And maybe along as the event goes on, maybe I'll see and become inspired by some of the, the qualifier matches and already start on a couple of these missions. Uh, and that will be really cool. So uh, the qualifier starts on... Uh, let me get my calendar out here. Uh, the qualifier begins on the 20th, which is, of course, Saturday. It's four short days from now from when I'm recording this. Obviously, when it comes out publicly, it will be three days because three. So that's worth pointing out. But uh, the uh, actual main event is slated to begin the week after on the 27th. Uh, there is a chance that we push it back depending on how many, how much time we still have to do to the qualifier stuff because I want to give time for people to prepare for their first match uh, opponent. Uh, and but uh, so I will I will acknowledge that here. But the current plan is 20th of July qualifier. 27th of July is when the main event kicks off. We have games set to be played Saturday and Sunday for both of those weekends. Uh, and of course, there will be more days uh, carved out if need be. So uh, and of course, if availability is willing. So there you go. A preview of Tyrant's Tale and some talk of the campaign content that will be about it. Oh yeah, and I actually meant to show the ranking before on the screen, so I will do that now. You can see here, this is what I was talking about earlier with the uh, classes. We only have the upper classes on the website as far as rankings are concerned, but you can go to Cosmonarchy Brood War, uh, well, fraudsclub.com slash cosmonarchy dash BW slash sites slash rankings, or you can just look at the link in the description. I told you I posted it there. Click that bad boy and see. But yes, this is the, uh, this is the page. Now that you've seen it, we can go on to the community roundup so as usual, one of the things that I enjoy doing is shouting out the players, the people, the individuals who have joined us since I last recorded an episode of Prototype. Uh, obviously, I, I did shout out uh, players like Sadistic and Kaboomwer because they've been playing some games of Cosmonarchy actively, and uh, Sadistic has actually uh, participated in the tournament. That's uh, Lingchamp, uh, uh, but now he's changed his username, so I actually have no idea what he's up to. Uh, but he's a Zerg player, so pretty cool stuff, pretty cool stuff. Uh, other than that, we have uh, a couple of other, uh, a pair of people who have joined us and have been playing games. Uh, Steven, just, just, just Steven, that, that's his name, uh, and Game Dominator 77. Uh, Game Dominator, the friend of Smarty Cakes, as far as I understand, and Steven, just some guy who uh, apparently used to play StarCraft II and now is interested in Cosmonarchy. He got it, everything installed, figured out how to tell Norton to stop being malware, at least for the time being, and uh, was able to get everything set up and, and got playing. Uh, I guess Three Crow was helping him out over voice chat and stuff as well for like understanding the game and stuff. So pretty cool stuff, pretty cool stuff. Uh, welcome new Cosmonarchs. We're going to jump into our map recap as well. This is Fields of Sir Nunos. Uh, I, this is a 2v2 map that started out as a 1v1 map. It's by the Shambler. I told Shambler that he should uh, upload images of his map if he wants me to take a look at them. So uh, that is that. Uh, and indeed, you can see it. Uh, we've got some uh, geysers on the low ground up there in the sort of like eyeballs of the map, if you will. The uh, not exactly... Uh, it's to the left of 12 o'clock and to the right of 12 o'clock. So it's not exactly... Uh, you know, 11 and 1, but it's kind of close enough. Uh, the uh, positions on the south of the map are very interesting, I would say, as far as expansions are concerned. Uh, and the pathways in the middle of the map, I I have no real idea if they're uh, any good. Uh, I think the nexuses on the fields there are pretty impossible to break. Uh, I still don't know about that as, a, as an idea for uh, allowing to wall. Uh, but obviously this being a 2v2 map, it looks to me like the south spawn player on both sides, so player 2 and player 4 in the uh, map shot, that looks like it's really quite difficult to hold. So uh, I, I really don't know how you're going to wrangle that, because like in order to expand, you have to deal with people coming in from maybe three different angles, plus the air raid above your natural. So that looks like it would be virtually impossible to hold to me. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, there, we'll have to wait for some 2v2s to be played. We'll have to wait. 
I, I did want to shout out Three Crow, who made a map called Fight Club. Uh, Cosmonarchy or a uh, you know, TNFC Fight Club, I think is what it is. Uh, so there's player you can pick heroes, and I am apparently on the roster. I have not played this yet. Uh, you use a bunch of spells and stuff to uh, to do hero arena things. Uh, I think right now the version that uh, he has posted is for uh, you. You basically have like it's three v three, but not all at once. It's um, a one v one situation, and then you you fight each other in one v one. Uh, and, and then you get like tagged in or whatever uh, versus a different opponent, presumably. I'm not sure how it works, uh, but it's pretty cool as an idea. Uh, and uh, I, I think he is going to work on a version that is act actively everybody at once 3v3. So uh, it could be interesting to see that kind of thing in action. But if you've been wondering for, you know, looking for wild UMS maps, I mean, just looking at the map layout, it kind of tells you that it's a wild UMS map, right? So uh, let's see what ends up happening. This is Cold Sweat, a map by Veek7. I referenced this earlier in my talking about the ranking and, and the tournaments and stuff, like what might be in play. Uh, this map may end up being in play. It has been updated a few times after some playtesting, and you'll you'll notice here that we've got spawns in the top left and the bottom right. Uh, this is a two-spawn 1v1 map, and there's a natural, a very uh, open-ish third, uh, but only two pathways to worry about, so at least there's that. And you can fork the natural and the third, which I think is an important it doesn't have to be adhered to in every single map, but it's important to include it if you are looking to make a decision in that sort of stage. Uh, and if you, if, if the third is kind of like safe and cordoned off away from the, the natural, then you might want to consider like maybe reducing the worker count, the resource ca node count or whatever on the uh, third base and stuff like that. So worth, uh, worth pointing out there, worth pointing out. Uh, other than that, we've got some uh, pseudo island bases. You can destroy the Atlas uh, on the ramps there. And that will allow you to bust into that uh, sort of, I guess that's just dead on three and nine o'clock. Uh, but those are where the treasuries are, uh, the neutral treasuries. There's also neutral treasuries in the top right and the bottom left uh, with much less resources. Uh, so you can harvest from those if you so desire. Uh, and a little bit of a cheeky like worker transfer kind of thing. But if they get caught, they might be dead. Uh, and uh, looking at how flexible the pathways are in the upper right and the top left, or sorry, the the upper right and the bottom left, the um, looking at that, where you've got three ramps onto the platform, the, the put a bit of a plateau that actually has that uh, double gas base and then the uh, Atlas blocking the treasury base. That is an interesting location. And I feel like just the way that that is set up, um, that's probably going to be a very important uh, nexus of control that you're going to want to try to achieve uh, some sort of dominion over. But you also have to watch out for your army's, uh, you know, en enemy's army uh, moving directly into the, the low ground middle. Uh, so I, I don't know. There's there's some interesting ideas at play in here. I'm not sure if it's uh, it feels like maybe the, the map will be too cloistered and too too uh, small in terms of the pathways uh, where the termination points are. They, they kind of funnel you into having smaller armies. I would I would think um, both the low ground paths, which are liable for random harassment from those cliffs, uh, will uh, are, are ultimately they they don't really pay host to very large armies uh, on the ground. But also the ramps that you have. Uh, in the uh, three and nine positions, or I guess the, I, it's like two and eight positions or something like that. Um, those those ramps are pretty small, uh, the ones that face into the middle, and then the ones that face into the top right and the bottom left are even smaller. That, that last point is probably fine, uh, but looking at the ramps into the middle, those are very small, uh, despite having a fairly open angle uh, into them. Although again, the high ground there is going to be there for uh, pinching off that with static defense and stuff. Uh, obviously a general note, uh, when it comes to ramps that lead into neutral territory that you should jockey over, we tend to build uh, build in a lot of unbuildable tiles so that you can't just build right up against the ramp. Uh, that is something that Veek had to learn the hard way on the Purgatory uh, and other maps that were kind of like it, like uh, in that way, like Titan Forge by the Shambler. These are situations where just controlling the ramp was super, super prohibitive for any ground army movement. And so adding the unbuildable tiles makes a lot of sense there. Something that Veek should definitely consider, in my opinion. Uh, but anyway, a pretty interesting looking map. And we've got another snow tile set map. This one a lot more on the dirt side. And you can see here that this one is by Biddyby. I guess you can't really see that just by anything on the map, but uh, interesting stuff there. And uh, yes, another two spawn map, bottom left and top right. Interesting sort of like pseudo bridge construction there in the... Uh, uh, upper and lower middles. This map is uh, clearly requiring some extra custom tiles at some point. Uh, and uh, he's not using the right dirt tile either. So I, 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 I'm i going to be honest, I don't really know. Oh, I guess I, I see what he's trying to do. He's trying to avoid having any snow 
even at 12 and 6. <clears throat> I think that uh, that is a bit of a, an error, uh, but uh, definitely something that uh, we'll have to wait and see about. Uh, there, there are more uh, elegant dirt blends of the snow cliff to dirt uh, that DF made a long time ago. These are like a scrap cobbled together piece that I did myself way back. Uh, that uh, eventually I want to replace. And so maybe I should just go in and replace them so that Pity Bee doesn't have to do a bunch of tile work. We'll have to see. Uh, but he did also ask me for some ramps that I've uh, written down as notes for me to do. Looking at the actual construction of the map, uh, interesting choices uh, to set up the ice water. I don't know, there's something about this map that is unsettling visually. Like the fact that you've got the ice and the snow and stuff, and then immediately into like dirt and the, and the, and the dirt water. There's something about that that's just not it for me. I don't know what's going on here. That, that's really weird. I'm trying to push past the aesthetics, but uh, just looking at the construction of the map, um, it doesn't... So it looks like this stuff is just unbuildable in the dead center, and I think that's what's going on here with these tiles. This one would also be unbuildable, but like these sections here with the grass and the, the chain link, the mesh, those would be buildable. Uh, so I wonder about that. I guess that's uh, because like the dead middle of the map is supposed to be like that, but... If anything, I would imagine that the center part where it's currently unbuildable should be, doesn't have to be buildable, but that would make the most sense. These other parts being buildable seem like a miss because look at all the area that they allows you to project. You can project control over everything in the middle just by putting like anchors or sentinels or, you know, wardens or circuits or whatever. Like you can put a lot of control project out over here. So I'm not really sure why that was chosen as the buildable terrain instead of the stuff that would be lower impact in the middle. Um, like if you cleaned out like these four pieces here in the dead center as buildable terrain and everything else was unbuildable, I, I would think that that would make a lot more sense. Uh, but anyway, I'm not sure what BDB was thinking exactly. Maybe he can elaborate in the comments or whatever. Uh, the bases overall seem okay. Uh, I'm not a super fan of, um, I guess, it, you know, I was talking about uh, Cold Sweat and how you can fork the natural in the third and you can kind of do that here. Uh, but uh, the natural pathing kind of leads you to the natural, funnily enough, uh, from the bridge area over here. And then to go from that to take a left, um, there's something about this that feels a bit unnatural, uh, but also a bit very, very open. Uh, but anyway, this looks very similar to Derelict with the extra gas ridge, but not as many mineral fields. Yeah, in fact, this looks this layout is basically derelict as I, as I see it. Uh, obviously, the the aspect ratio of the map is a bit different, uh, and there's some island bases. <clears throat> but uh, hey, there's island bases on the new derelict as well. Uh, there's no anchor over here, so I guess that's a difference. And there's nothing in the middle of the map that uh, screams treasury. These ice bases are also uh, not in, not present in derelict, so that's a bit different. Uh, but uh, the the main natural third, fourth, fifth, and island is uh, very very evocative of the current derelict. Um, so obviously a bit different, right? Overall, I would say I'm um, trying to go from dirt to dirt is probably not very wise for readability's sake and uh, something that uh, I guess we should try to fix on the tile set level. Uh, I'm not really a fan of the aesthetics, as I mentioned, with like the ice and snow. Like if this was the snow water instead of the dirt water, that would make a bit more sense. But then obviously the whole point of the map seems to be that you're trying to minimize the, the snow. The problem is that some people who, would, who say that they have issues playing on the ice tile sets, I can understand that, I guess, to some degree. I can't really compare myself to, I've never had a problem with that. So it's hard for me to like relate, but I can understand, I can comprehend what they are saying. Um, this looks like it would be much worse. Maybe this is just me saying what they say, but in a different way that like, I can't tell what's a ramp and what's not using this tile. Obviously this one's a lot more clear on that front, um, but it's really hard for me to tell depth and where I am on the map, looking at the way that all of it is just grass and dirt. So that would be something to maybe think about trying to do uh, differently with regards to the tiles themselves, like the actual textures that are on the map. Uh, but besides that, I'm um, trying to think if there's anything else that I can bring up as far as a structural thing. I do think that the middle definitely needs some tweaks. Um, obviously the map needs some custom tiles anyway. And I'm not sure. I guess the significance of this bridge is that it's unbuildable and that's probably why it's there. Um, in that case, I would probably pull it out a little bit more so it fully covers this area or I would push this cliff in or whatever, depending on what you want for pathability. Um, yeah, I don't know, just not sure. Not 100% sure about that one. I think I would need to see some games on it to further validate my my opinion. But uh, right now, uh, a little bit of a weird one for me. So that is what I have to say about that. Well, it's time for coffee questions. And you know what that means. We're gonna be going to a different world. Uh, obviously some of these questions will involve Cosmonarchy, but many of them involve my other 
fictional settings that I have made for sci-fi, uh, things like Pangea, which is the code name of a different one, uh, or I guess it's not really the code name. I guess that we were using that as the code name for the game, but you can you can call it that for the setting. Uh, uh, basically, a galaxy-sized super construct, uh, a super continent, uh, if you will. And so uh, there's not really space. Uh, you just travel for a really, really, really long time. Uh, so that's sort of like the premise of that one. Then there is, of course, Zibalba, which is my sort of a magnum opus in the making. Uh, lots and lots and lots of room for lots of crazy sci-fi stuff there. And of course, uh, besides that, we'll be talking about Cosmonarchy itself, uh, and then we'll close ourselves out. Uh, uh, oh, and of course, uh, yeah, there, there's a, there is a technically a question about the Escozi there that I forgot to write. <laughs> uh, but uh, if you want to join us, if you want to join our mission, there's that link at the bottom left. It'll be there until the end of the show as I am now beginning the coffee section. $3 a month and up gives you access to our channel, gives you access to questions, uh, gives you access to development streams of a particular project, uh, and $12 a month and up gives you access to all future development streams that are private, uh, including the one that is uh, already in, a couple of them that are already in development. Uh, so stay tuned for that, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be catching you. We'll be catching you on that, uh, that aisle, that Ahmed Arsen aisle that I mentioned earlier. All right, let's get into it. We have a question from none other than the Shambler to kick ourselves off here. Uh, Shambler asks, uh, Cosmonarchy Terrans are dropped off in Pangea. What happens? Uh, so actually, Cosmonarchy Terrans have a pretty powerful arsenal. Um, the materials that you make, uh, that you have access to in Pangea are, I would say, very different. Not necessarily less like more primitive. I mean, they are less advanced from a technological standpoint, but they give you different properties. So I actually, th I do think that Terrans would outgun, the, the Cosmonarchy Terrans would outgun the uh, the Pangea uh, populace because they're, they're using very different kinds of technology. Uh, and so like the, the kind of warfare isn't as kinetic uh, as it is in Cosmonarchy. Um, so they probably just dominate everything. Uh, but, uh, you know, in a similar way that I was talking about um, what would happen if, like, another Zabalba regency appeared in 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 Chrysilliant, the se sector for Cosmonarchy, uh, the idea there uh, is that, like, well, they have all of this technology, but part of the reason why it's so powerful and advanced is because they made it with better materials. They had access to better materials, and Chrysilliant doesn't have those materials. So just like that, Pangea doesn't have the materials Chrysilliant has. Um you know, some of it might be that they've, you know, the Terrans use different smelting and harvesting uh, processes uh, than what the Pangea factions do. But when you're talking about the way that Cosmonarchy uh, materials are, are assembled into stuff, I don't know, like, that's the kind of thing where definitely their weapons would end up being kind of like, they need to be adapted to, to fire munitions created to uh, being able to be harvested from these locations. Uh, they would definitely need to be um, you know, retrofitted, a lot of them would end up being relics, like Warhammer 40k style, where uh, it, when you lose them, uh, you, you, it's like a, a loss you never truly recover from because you can't really remake them in that way. So definitely after a certain amount of time, uh, the Terrans would uh, be out of their ability, out of their element and need to adapt their technology. Uh, and if they were smart, uh, they would immediately start doing that kind of adaptation because otherwise there's not really any hope uh, for a prolonged existence for like millennia or whatever. Uh, but they would be able to take over the, you know, a significant chunk of that galaxy sized supercontinent fairly quickly. Uh, the only thing is that space travel is not very useful in Pangea for obvious reasons. Um, you can't really navigate, uh, like, you know how in, in the Dune setting, uh, the, by Frank Herbert, there's the, uh, the spice guild and these guys, these navigators use the, the, the drug to, see the future and avoid incoming debris and, st and asteroids and whatever else, obstacles for space travel. Otherwise, you would just blow up. Um, that's kind of like what you can imagine happens inside Pangea. The way that you move and, and teleport um, any sort of, you know, you transport any sort of military force has to be done very carefully and not with technology that you would immediately consider. Uh, you can't use space travel. You can't use stuff like that. Uh, the supercontinent itself uh, uh, has... It avails the inhabitants of ways to maneuver armies, but you have to know how to access that, tap into that, and use it. And if you're going to use it in a more brute force manner, that would be not exactly using spaceship engines and stuff, but 
it would be through some kind of propulsion or whatever. I mean, it's just, it's not really that tenable. Like it would be very slow. It would be slow going. Uh, or you would have to basically like find some way, and there are ways to do this in the Pangea setting, but you would have to find some way to literally carve through the supercontinent itself, like terrain of the, uh, you'd have to insulate yourself and basically you'd be digging through mountains. You'd be carving through, you know, uh, a, a bunch of crazy uh, things. Uh, there's like areas where there are enormous, you know, mountain sized uh, flower uh, concentrations and flower fields and stuff. There's uh, enormous uh, constructions like uh, giant, uh, towers and, and whatnot that you'd have to go through. Like there's so many things that you'd have to carve through. Uh, when that kind of thing happens, people take note and it's not something that is, um, let's just say that you'd, you'd be drawing in on a, you'd get a, you'd get quite the crowd. I think a lot of Terrans would try to do that and maybe their, um, their spacecraft would survive for a little bit, but like eventually even the, the most, you know, like even the, the 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 crescillant material, you know, hulls of some of these spacecraft, I think they would eventually hit the the right way, uh, you know, get the right kind of thing caught in their in their engines or you know whatever. Um, I guess they they might have some like nominal shields and stuff for that sort of thing, but like, just it it wouldn't exactly. There's going to be some things that are more dense than what the ships are, and and that would eventually destroy them. So, uh, it, plus it would just uh, attract a lot of attention, and, and eventually there'd be enough numbers from the Pangaea. Uh, inhabitants that they would exhaust whatever the Terrans have for munitions and uh, overwhelm them. So uh, I don't know exactly if that would happen or if it, they would take the wise route and adapt their technology and dominate with the, you know, resources that they do have that they carried with them. But that would, that would, those would be like two potential outcomes of that. So hopefully that answers the question, but interesting stuff. I don't get to talk about Pangea very often, so cool question from The Shambler. We've got Three Crow who asks about, uh, well, this is a funny question. If Ahmed gathered all the versions of himself from all the timelines in order to become a Zabalba Regency, what would the cornerstones and playstyle be? Well, you would definitely have Ahmeds that throw other Ahmeds uh, because physical strength and brute force, uh, ridiculous durability, um, these are like key characteristics about Ahmed. Uh, obviously, anything related to fire, there'd definitely be a lot of flame, like the whole thing would be fire-based. Um, there would be some people that would just like beat each other over the head with, you know, chicken wings or, or uh, drumsticks or something. Uh, that would definitely be one of them. So uh, there would be like, I think I think the worker would probably just be like a, a, an, uh, an undercooked uh, chicken or something. And then maybe the worker could like cook itself uh, to um, I increase the movement speed of allies within the area, sort of like the Zorius, uh, Zorius the Storming Omen, uh, but uh, as an aura to allies, uh, but eventually it would burn itself out, right? Uh, so it would be like, uh, you, you sacrifice this unit to increase movement speed, so you can pull it with you to, like, do crazy worker pulls or whatever uh, for that reason, and, and uh, the, you know, that would be a very silly thing. Um, so that would be one thing that might be an option. Uh, definitely a, a thing where uh, there would be like a, a chicken, like a, there would be a meat branch or like a chicken branch or whatever food branch. And th this this uh, sustenance branch would be responsible for enchanting, healing, um, debuffing, uh, any sort of like combat disruption or enchantment uh, st sort of thing. That would definitely be involved there. That's probably where your specialists are, your sacrificial units are, uh, where some of your... Um, more oddball units are in general. Uh, there would be that, that, so that would probably be like branch two or branch three or whatever. Uh, branch one would be the, uh, like the, the clones, right? Uh, that would be like the standard fare sort of thing. And then, uh, yeah, there'd be the Ockmex, right? Or whatever the, the, the branch would be there for like branch two or, you know, whatever the, the food branch isn't, <laughs> there would be that. Uh, so, you know, you get some, some ideas there. There'd be like Mickin launchers and stuff. You'd just like fire, uh, you know, maybe there would be like the, um, any, anything to do with pickle farming and throw pickles at the enemy. There's uh, definitely some stuff there uh, that you could draw upon uh, since uh, Ahmed and his father before him was a, a pickle farmer. Uh, and so that was, that was what he was before he became a deity or uh, realized he was a deity. Uh, he, he constantly forgets his godlike power, uh, which is one of the reasons why stuff just happens around him very bizarrely. Um, you can kind of think about Ahmed as like a walking improbability matrix or a improbability machine, whatever it's called from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, th there's a lot of stuff like that where he just, it's sort of like on a whim, things just occur and, uh, you know, th th that's what happens. So, um, 
yeah, very strange. Uh, very strange. Uh, fan theory. Uh, Ahmed is a Colopoazos. Uh, you know, a Colopoid. Uh, no, not really, but maybe. Wink. Uh, not, But not really, wink. But, uh, you know, fan theory. Uh, but anyway, the uh, you know, there's definitely some shit going on there. So uh, as far as cornerstones go, I do think that Ahmed... Ahmed Re- uh, Regency would, would involve um, a lot of things that debuff enemies, uh, which would be kind of an interesting thing to focus on because... Like, Ahmed is already pretty strong, so he, his units would be pretty meaty, uh, pun intended. His units would be um, difficult to deal with, and he would need to kind of... Like, he wouldn't have a great amount of damage, but he would stay alive for a good amount of time. And he would try to debuff you so you could stand still or you would uh, stay in the in the damage fields and, and, you know, be susceptible to being on fire and stuff like that. That that would probably be some of his focuses, is trying to debuff it, take more fire damage, take more, uh, like, more damage over time or whatever. Um... Uh, armor ends, stuff like that. So, yeah, these are the kinds of things that you'd probably see out of the, the Ahmed Regency. Hopefully, uh, that was enough fodder for Three Crow's brain. Uh, very, very silly question, but also I, I hope I took it seriously enough for his liking. <laughs> now, Biddy B asks uh, another kind of uh, mechanically interesting question. If you had to swap the three races up thematically and mechanically, how, what and how would you do? Uh, like, what would you do? How would you do it? An example, would you make Terran play Swarmy like Zerg or High Tech like Protoss and so on? So thinking about Cosmonarchy's regencies, or races, I suppose I should be saying, uh, just oscillating between Zabalba, which has regencies, Pangea, which has factions, and, uh, you know, or I guess species is like the better term for Pangea, actually. I'll have to think about that. And then um, Cosmonarchy, which has races. Uh, so the, uh, the Zerg obviously plays Swarmy, uh, but thinking about the way that they... I'm going to kind of try, try to imagine a path of released resistance for this. Um, because I'm thinking about like trying to preserve the thematics actually, but, um, you, you know, I, I think you can take a, conv- like you can take a, a thematic concept, like a, a, a prompt, like a writing prompt almost. And there's so many different ways you can try to achieve that. And I think like a good, uh, debater, uh, would be able to, uh, argue in favor of one thing or another. And so that's what I'm going to try to do here. So for Zerg, in the context of you um, trying to change them up from the way that they are right now, which is very swarmy, uh, I would say Zerg would probably be the high-tech one. And the reason I would go for that is because you could imagine converging evolution on uh, small numbers of very powerful things. And so the the higher up you get, like Zerg would, instead of um, taking, say, one Zethercore, turning it into one Vorvercore, uh, they would lose all of their two spawn units. All of their two spawn units would be given to whoever ends up being the swarmy one. If that's uh, presumably that would be Terran, and Protoss would be the uh, the, in- the the versatile, the in between. You could probably see how that would be pretty easily achieved. But uh, um, the two spawn units would instead um, be uh, more significantly uh, potent than they are statistically. A bit more expensive, similar to Protoss in that way. But that we, I'd bring back that Archon merge uh, thing that the the Cantavis, that the Templar used to have uh, in Cosmonarchy, but also in Starcraft One they obviously have it. In Starcraft Two they have it. Uh, the the unit merges would be the evolution that the way that way to uh, morph units. So Zethercore is morphing into Vorvacores. It would be two of them to morph into that. Uh, that that would be one way that I would preserve that evolution mechanic. The idea that you're arriving at a more powerful, more potent, um, and more singular uh, thing out of the many. Uh, so, uh, and I would probably cut down on the tech nodes slightly and make it so that the, there is more evolution of the, uh, of the pools in a world where maybe technically speaking, it would be possible to do something like this. I would imagine using workers to build on top of a pool, uh, another pool. So you're even, a, you're even merging the, the, the structures in a way. Uh, and, and that would basically allow you to upgrade the structure into, say, like, that's how you get the Vornath, is you sacrifice another worker, uh, stuff like that, uh, plus the cost of whatever the structure is. And then it evolves. And then, you know, that would mean that you would need two pools to upgrade the, the Vornath into the, the Kalkir and stuff like that. But you, would lose, you, you wouldn't have the Iral Iris and the Othstalava form anymore, uh, as an example. So, like, that, that might be one of the ways that you do it. Uh, maybe you uh, would try to take, like, say, evolution, because you can kind of think about it as, like, trying to evolve different things. You can take, say you build a, a pool, you can, you can build like the three core structures, right? Pool, den, shroud. And then you can double down on what those provide by building another pool. But if you combine the den with the pool, then you would get, say, the spire. And if you combine the shroud with the den, then maybe that gives you the eteth, the, uh, the Alkag eteth. And if you combine the pool with the shroud, you get the, the metraval nest, 
right? And so you can kind of think about how like you would combine all of those things. Uh, so like once you have a spire, if you're able to combine the spire with the, I, I'm just going to throw out a, an idea here. Uh, maybe you you combine the spire with the uh, the the nest, and that's get what gives you the axe toth, or maybe that gives you the anter. I guess that would probably do the Elmacus anter, uh, since that's like the uh, it, well, no, because th that's just when you take the nest and you you double it uh, down with the nest. But anyway, that's like one idea, and then the the grotto would be like the eteth with the spire, uh, probably, and then I guess there'd be like a third thing uh, that would be the. Uh, um, the uh, the e the eteth with the the nest in that sense and so that that would be like one way that, to think about it so you'd basically be like fusing and merging the um the tech nodes as well so that's how I would do zerg uh, a rough idea I mean there's more that I could go into but we're in the interest of answering all of the different aspects of the question I'm not going to tunnel on one race uh, for protoss um, I think it's fine to keep the deployables and and the deployments on the Terran side uh, I do think that protoss uh, since they would end up being a bit more populous, uh, they would need a lot of time cost reductions uh, and resource cost reductions. Uh, but I think that you would end up, um, one of the things you would do is you would axe pylon power and uh, you, would, you would make uh, terrain-based construction unique to Zerg, which is another thing that uh, like maybe then Kagra could be like in investigated as like doing more because pylon power is no longer a thing. Uh, and then, um, you know, I think you would probably uh, say that, like, without pylon power, the structures can remain the same, but the units need to go down in costs in, in both time and in resource. And then the um, the shielding, maybe pylon power stays, but only as a mechanic to enable shields. Uh, and, and so, like, you would actually lose the shields because you're no longer as powerful, technologically speaking, uh, that's been removed. Uh, you're more reliant on, like, another way. And that's kind of, like, evocative of the idea of like the healing thing, right? And so like the Terran healing uh, requirement or, or the thing that they, they maintain is like more important, uh, that, he that healing process, that would be something that is very important to Terran currently that would become important to Protoss. And so that's how you would have that. You'd have units that like proc it, like maybe the Ecclesiast provides power around itself as an aura, uh, as an example, or like maybe that's like a, a more higher tier unit or something. Uh, just, a, just a couple of ideas. Uh, that, we, that means that Zerg, by the way, would have to have some kind of powerful healing or, or, you know, we could think about giving them some sort of powerful healing um, opportunities because we're taking flash shielding and sort of taking the concept and moving that, moving the idea of that over to, uh, to Zerg. Uh, for, for Terrans, uh, since we're removing the healing aspect, um, there would probably be like structures that provide healing, uh, similar to how they, we had this idea that uh, Zerg would regenerate faster on Kagra. That is something that we had in a very old implementation of the game. Uh, so... You could imagine like a, the Vestry add-on for the stockade and maybe some other structures and add-ons and such would provide a uh, healing aura. Um, but, uh, and maybe like units that were deployed would uh, have some sort of self-healing process. But because you're talking about m many more units, that, that would be almost like the Lachizalisk burrowing for Zerg right now is that, uh, you know, deploying these units into combat modes uh, that are more specialized uh, would, would provide them with healing. You would lose the healing. You wouldn't have... Um, like maybe maybe the healing would still be like you'd still make the clerics and the shamans, but they would operate very differently because they wouldn't be about like, you know, the cleric is very much about like you take many clerics and you heal like the one unit or like that's one thing that you we see happening in the meta a lot. And so that would probably be something that would instead be like mass healing or, you know, maybe when you have a shaman around, it gives you an armor bonus. Uh, and so the cleric is what heals, but the shaman just, you know, gives you armor and uh, maybe does something with incoming projectiles or whatever sort of like a pseudo Vilgora core in some ways uh, with the protection field that it provides, but uh, the, the mini carapace form. Um, I don't know, something like that. Uh, that. That could be like an extension of the Anseal almost in, in some ways, the Shaman uh, in, in this world. And uh, definitely would have like, um, you know, there's the idea of the reactor add-on in StarCraft II. I don't know that we would explore that here, uh, but it's some, something to encourage and accelerate the n number of military units made uh, at the cost of their stats going down because they're becoming more swarmy, that would be something where like bio would really heavily be stressed, and then armor is, um, you know, a bit more on the side of like the uh, the mecha mechanized branches and such are a little bit more about maybe frontline reinforcing. Like maybe the vulture would have more uh, lobotomy mines, like a way to get more mines. The um, you know, a lot more units would probably put down like uh, armaments and, and, and whatnot, not for sieging, uh, but for like combat disruption, like wards basically, or whatever you would, would call it. Like I, we call the lobotomy mine internally a trap, um, but you know, whatever you would say there is like placing 
uh, these like little uh, turrets or, or sub sub things like that. And so, uh, yeah, these are these are some of the ideas that I'd probably explore. I hope that was thorough enough for Biddy B. Uh, that is the answer to his question. Now we go to Inoslex who asks, um, talking about the uh, uh, cosmonarchy again. Uh, how well do you think cosmonarchy will translate to a movie or TV show? What parts of it would work and what wouldn't work, or would none of it work? And all of it, is, uh, all of the aspects are only good for a game. I, I think there's a lot that you could try to do for a, a TV series. Uh, I guess the main thing that uh, you know, if you wanted to do a movie. Um, or a TV show, like a serial. I think it would probably work best in serial format, uh, which is like the term for TV shows, basically, because we're not, we don't watch them on TV most of the time anymore. Uh, so it's like, I guess, a more technically accurate pedantic term. Um, so I would say, looking at that, that when you're talking about uh, playing towards the idea of, of like taking what you have as far as cosmonarchy is concerned, the best thing you can do about that, or the best thing you can do about uh, trying to build a... Uh, film or, or serial in, in what is previously not that kind of like you're adapting it and and with cosmonarchy there's like so many different things that you could focus on you have to kind of i think you should write your own story actually you should write a story and then understand that i mean a, a lot of special effects are going to be required um but you could imagine a world where you find a way to focus in on some parts of the like you know, the, the difficult aspects of it. Uh, you could, I guess you could take some of the campaign planning that we already have. Like I think to touch the sun could make an interesting serial or film, uh, where I, I would probably have to be a serial, but like, I think you could basically do what American horror story did as far as I'm aware, where each season is like self-contained, even though it might be set within the same setting or, or universe or world or whatever. Uh, that's basically what I would probably try to advocate for is, you know, the first season uh, would be, say, you could uh, do, do it around the campaign plot of To Touch the Sun, where you've got a, a green, um, you know, military commander for the Orion Imperium. He arrives on a world that where they think it's just a, a casual uh, sort of rebellion or whatever. And you would see uh, the, these these commanders would not be sitting idly in their command posts. They would become dramatized as like, you know, frontline uh, commanding officers, you know, leading this battalion to into war. Uh, and, you know, there'd be like, uh, you know, you'd have shots of like harvesting op operations and base construction and whatnot. Uh, so you definitely have that as like a point, but you wouldn't focus on that. You would focus on like the actual operations being held, um, you know, trying to gather information about uh, what, what is going on with these rebels. And then it would be revealed that the Alarion rebels are actually uh, Nidus Trinity uh, cohort, right? Like a, a Nidus Trinity sect. So, uh, that would be a very uh, startling revelation, and then the Zerg would arrive. And so just mission one alone could be your pilot episode for sure, where we have the arrival of the green characters. Um, you, you'd start off by seeing, like, it would probably be, like, one of those things where the opening shot could be, like, uh, rebel action and, like, a rebel transmission or whatever, and then pretty soon after the, uh, like, as towards the end or towards the windup of the, of the rebel transmission, it kind of pans back to reveal our protagonist sort of like studiously studying it for, and like the guy who's uh, his um, foil in some ways, who's been around a little bit more, but is still kind of green himself. Uh, his, his co-pilot, so to speak, his co uh, commander, I uh, would be like, man, how many times are you going to watch that or whatever? And so like, we would change the whole intro of the campaign, uh, but it would basically be like talking about how they just arrived uh, or he just arrived specifically our protagonist. And then going through the whole idea there about how, uh, they're going to deploy, the, like, the, like the troops are already starting to deploy. We'd see the, uh, that then we would, like, you know, update a shot to, because we would introduce, like, the, the initial idea that there's, like, rebels happening over here, or, you know, re rebellions going on. And then a uh, shot of the, the waste to the moon again, after seeing it from the rebels' perspective, but you see, like, the, the operations of the Orion Imperium making landfall and, and harvesting resources and deploying troops and uh, stuff like that, like assembling some uh, mechanical units and, and forward posts and whatnot. And, uh, you know, you might even see, like, uh, like there'd be dialogue that would reference the RTS stuff, right? You'd hear, uh, you know, so, like, you'd, you'd have uh, the two different battalions, so we would see, like, split perspectives uh, after a certain point when they were starting to uh, move uh, on, and take forward positions across, like, bridges and, or, like, from the other side of bridges. And you'd hear talk about, like, how, you know, the uh, we, we've concluded, yeah, we finished our expansion. Uh, you know, so, something like that, right? Like, we've expanded, uh, you know, we've just uh, secured additional resources, something like that, right? Uh, we'd figure out, like, how to do that. And then 
you know, as you get closer and closer to that bridge, uh, it, it, there would eventually be a reaction where they'd storm the front and it would be more than just the rebels. Uh, there would be, um, you know, some like it would be initially it would just be like total chaos with the the many, many uh, bio forces like charging in and collapsing. And then, you know, you'd have your like you'd see the Orion Imperium uh, Cyprians and stuff uh, taking aim and, and blasting with their, their rail guns. Uh, but eventually, as things uh, happen, like there'd be a phalanx deployed on the other side of the bridge and they'd like force a fallback or whatever. And as they're starting to fall back, um, like in the in the bedlam of the fallback or whatever, uh, you know, a cohort would charge our uh, our senior, you know, our protagonist. And uh, then he would be like, oh, shit, like what's going on? And then, you know, they'd um, on the other side while that's happening and reports are coming in that it's Nidus Trinity, uh, we'd have the, the co-commander guy be on another, uh, he'd be like on an, uh, a stab, like he's trying to go ahead and charge forward uh, to attack into the, the main uh, rebel base. He's still assuming it's rebellions. And then you'd have the, um, the Zerg, you know, be a, a feature. They would, they would deploy and suddenly he'd be like totally surrounded. And then that maybe like, basically that would probably be like the high point of the, the first, the pilot episode and then finding a way to like rescue that ally, um, you know, rally the troops, push back the, the rebels on one side. And then I guess we'd probably need like a supporting character that could be a bit more of a frontliner, um, in addition to our protagonist so that we could deploy the, like, we could have the frontliner stab in towards the, the main rebel base, the, the Nidus Trinity base while the, uh, our, our ally, our protagonist guy, uh, fights to go reclaim the ally. So that would be like probably one thing. And, and I don't know how long that episode would be. You could probably fit that in with a, enough like scene cutting and stuff for, for one episode, but like, that's just how, that's probably how I would try to adapt like that. I don't know if every episode would be one mission or if some missions could be, sort of um, compartmentalized and, and combined, uh, or maybe some missions would require many mission, many episodes, right? Like I could see a world where you just end the first episode on the arrival of the Zerg and like the, you know, like the, on that cliffhanger, like, oh shit, how are they going to show the Zerg? Uh, and that would be like the, the, the pitch for coming back for episode two. And then episode two opens up with that promise of here's the Zerg fight. Uh, and then, you know, that's when eventually like after the Zerg fight, which might go on for five to 10 minutes uh, of like, say, a 50 minute runtime uh, would eventually uh, conclude with like back against the wall. Not very many men left. Our commanding officer is still alive, but, you know, maybe wounded or something. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're making peace with the fact that they're probably not getting evac. And then some Trojans arrive and drop off combat drop Harakans and they land in and start lighting the place up and the Zerg end up uh, being driven back and shit. And that could be like the triumphant moment. Uh, and then, you know, we would have a, a a crest in the second episode or something where it's like, okay, now let's try to rally and push forward. You, you communicate with commander Ajax after and uh, figure out like what's going on and entering into the, the facility known as the mouth of the fall. Who no. Um, anyway, that's uh, that's an idea uh, that there's some, some talk there, but uh, pretty cool shit. Pretty cool shit. Anyway, thank you for the question in Oslix. Uh, that, that would be one example of how you could translate it. I think you would have to avoid heavy focus on the, the macro stuff. There would have to be, in the background, you would have to account for that as the writer, but you can't make it all about that because that doesn't really fit the medium of film and, and serials and TV shows and stuff. So hopefully that made sense. Moving on to Mirian's question. He asks about the Githroven commencement. Uh, if you were forced to contrive such a scenario, how would a Zababa universe enmeshed in the Githroven commencement come about? What regencies would continue to or cease to exist if the Githroven had their way? So uh, most regencies in Zababa would continue to exist in the Githrovan commencement. Um, but basically the idea is sort of like uh, reaching a heaven or some sort of apotheosis uh, en masse where there is no more conflict, no more uh, death via that. And, you know, commencement is like, I guess there's different stages of it, right? So there would be the commencement of uh, that uh, is achieved upon the conclusion of, of armed conflict and, and war. Uh, that commencement is like probably the most important one because then you can try to focus your efforts on solving other problems that are not related to war, uh, economic problems of economics, problem of problems of resources, problems of, you know, um, social issues or whatever. Those are the kinds of things that like, that would probably be commencement phase two is when there are no more problems and everybody just ex is able to exist under the stewardship and protection of the Githrovans themselves. Uh, and so, uh, very, very idyllic. Um, definitely very, um, what would you say? Uh, not, not Eritrean. I'm thinking of like, uh, there's that, uh, country in Africa that was named after, um, the idea of, of something being, uh, not a panacea, but a, uh, like perfection. Um, 
uh, and uh, Utopia uh, sort of thing. Uh, it begins with an E, but I can't remember the country's name right now for some reason. And uh, anyway, it's it's very much not a utopia <laughs> in real life, uh, which is unfortunate. And so jumping into the idea of uh, what, what, what uh, commencement would be like, it would be trying to achieve that. So uh, I, I'm afraid it wouldn't make for great, uh, v great video games uh, or great television or anything like that. It, it wouldn't do, go very well for ratings. It might not be very interesting or compelling, uh, but you can imagine how um, that would be a goal that would be uh, amenable. A lot of people would be amenable to that, uh, especially among Githrovan society, which is obviously wired very different than human society. So uh, I personally don't actually think that utopias are... Um, I think my idea of a utopia would be very different than the average person's idea of a utopia. Um, and uh, that is mostly because I, I very much believe in personal responsibility. Uh, and that's irrespective of whether or not like we have free will and all these other psychological ideas. I, I think personal accountability and responsibility is a necessary ingredient for um, civilization uh, uh, to be healthy anyway. So uh, definitely something that uh, I, I don't know that get throwing commencement would be a good thing actually, or even, it could be a thing, actually. Uh, but uh, from a philosophical standpoint, it's cool to think about how an alien species would try to conceptualize um, uh, basically achieving a state of utopia, a state, a state of uh, galactic apotheosis, universal apotheosis. And so getting to that point is definitely... Uh, that, that's, the, that's the difficult problem that they're finding it very difficult to solve. Uh, so uh, there are some races that would not make the cut. Uh, obviously, there are some regencies that would not make the cut. Uh, you're talking about anything that is artificial in nature, as in like deliberately engineered to be a weapon. So that includes Rune, Solar Throne, Roselium. And it's debatable as to whether or not Gadamemter would make the cut, uh, but uh, that is something that could probably be discussed. Uh, that is mostly because Gadamemter seems to um, have a, like a, an overall goal that is completely at odds with the idea of Utopia and could not really be... It, you can't really achieve commencement with Gadam Like, Gadamemter doesn't really have a, a, a place carved out for it in, in commencement um, because, like, its very nature is ingrained within and entwined within conflict. And probably the same for the Colopoazos, but just shutting them out of their dimension would probably be enough. Um, they, uh, Githrovans have a very un, un uncomfortable relationship with the Sykora, so that would be another thing that they'd have to try to sort of put to, a, put to an end, uh, but that would be another thing that would uh, be an interesting sort of battleground, if you will. And all right, I think that comes to uh, our final question here. Thank you, Miriam, for yours. Hopefully it was elucidating. We're going to go to the Beaver 99 he simply asks, will the Escozi apiary exist? Because uh, we were talking about this. Obviously, it's been a, a long time joke that Shambler wanted to call anchors apiaries because the, he thought that the Mavericks were bees or something. And I feel like that's such a stupid idea. Uh, but uh, Beaver really thought it was hilarious that Shambler was so hell bent on it. So now he thinks that uh, anything should be apiary. If it's not ultralisk, it should be apiary. That So goes the joke. Um, will the Escozi have a structure called an apiary? You know, uh, I... I do think Cosmoscope, which is the current name for their tier one air production facility, it's a bit difficult to uh, say that you're going to build a Cosmoscope and not feel like you're building something really epic. So maybe they do need a, a, a better name, like a, a, well, a worse name, and a, a lower, epic, a less epic name for their first uh, structure. Uh, but I don't know if Apiary is going to be it. So I can't really give an affirmation. I feel like if I add the Apiary to any race, then Shambler will never play any other race. So I have to really think about that very, very carefully. Uh, but uh, <laughs> in all seriousness, I guess you'll have to wait and see because iScript work continues and we are uh, pretty close to a breakthrough there. So stay tuned. Uh, it's like Cold Fusion. iScript extension is like Cold Fusion, but I promise we'll deliver. Uh, and with that, that is the end of the show. Ladies and gentlemen, we have gotten ourselves to the show intro. I do appreciate everybody who donates on coffee, everybody who contributes to our project, everybody who joined us for the tournament this past weekend, and everybody who will join us for our future tournaments and our future games indeed, because Cosmonarchy is not where it ends. Our story is uh, in many ways just beginning. Thank you for being a part of the No Frauds Club, and I will see you guys very soon for another episode of Prototype and another round of castovers and another round of dev streams. GG's. <laughs>